Hello guys, Winston here. A little while ago, my buddy Zach from the channel Bite Sized Engineering reached out asking for some help machining some aluminum parts to make a replica Scomplink terminal. A Scomplink, for the uninitiated, is a Star Wars Universe data interface for droids, over which information or commands important to the survival of the protagonist can be sent. To make his Scomplink a little more practical though, Zach would equip this design with a USB port. And like any round device in a sci-fi universe, he would rig up the Scomplink terminal to spin when something was plugged in. This project appealed to my inner nerd and would give me a good excuse to make some big chips on the Shapeoko HDM. Plus, since I've been busy lately transforming my garage into a shop, doing a video where I could just gloss over the design and motivation portion of the project and just show you guys some cam and toolpathing actually seemed like a good way to keep content coming. Now, given that no one really knows how a Scomplink works, it's difficult for me to reference the different parts of the receptacle with names that make any sense at all. So going forward, for lack of a better name, I'm just going to call this part that I'm working on the Scomplink Turbo Encabulator. The Turbo Encabulator isn't inherently that difficult a part to make. All of the essential geometry can be machined in a single setup. And since most of the features are cosmetic, the stakes are pretty low. But I thought this part would actually be a good example to show how I would analyze and approach machining a part made by someone else. It's a mental exercise I think anyone who's considering taking on projects in a job shop type capacity needs to go through. If I'm designing a part, I will both consciously and subconsciously limit myself to creating features I know are within my capabilities to produce. But a part that you get from someone else may not conform to the same set of design for manufacturability guidelines that you would adhere to. Communicating with a client about what is and isn't practical for you to manufacture is important in order to set the appropriate expectations on both sides of the deal. Let me give you a brief history of how the Turbo Encabulator's design evolved based on the back and forth emails between Zach and I. When Zach first approached me with a design concept, the first thing I pointed out was the inability of a round end mill to cut perfectly sharp corners. Manufacturability is always the first criteria you need to check a model for. Impossible to machine corners are very common to find when you're designing a part with a cosmetic intent. The second iteration Zach came back to me with was significantly better from a DFM perspective, but there were a few small details that still weren't optimized for the tools and materials at my disposal. First of all, Zach designed the turbo encabulator as a 1 inch tall piece. That seems like a logical round number, but in order to machine a part and guarantee that it hits spec, you need to start with a block of material that's a little bigger than the final part. So I would have to buy one and a quarter inch thick aluminum to start from. That increases the total cost and machining time. If you have a big VMC, that time difference isn't a big deal. For me though, I wanted to be able to knock out three of these in an afternoon. One for Zach, one for me, and one as a spare. If Zach had chosen metric units for this project instead of imperial trash units and gone with, say, 25 millimeters for the height of the encabulator, I could just skim off 0.2 millimeters off each face of a nominally 1 inch thick bar and be at the part's final thickness. In this case, since the design was to remain in imperial units, the final encabulator thickness would be 7 eighths of an inch. That I could live with. Another area that could be improved was the outer diameter. Turbo Encabulator Mark II was 4 inches in diameter, and though that's again a nice round number, it would force me to buy 5 inch wide bar stock instead of 4 inch bar stock, leading to more unnecessary machining that I wanted to avoid. So Zach agreed to reduce the OD to 3.75 inches. A simple, small decision like that reduces the material cost by roughly 20%. Now that the turbo encabulator was optimized for available stock, it was time to consider tooling. This part has a tall inner bore, and the only tool I have that will readily finish that wall without having a length of the shank rubbing against the wall is a quarter inch in diameter. Actually, any feature with walls taller than a half inch would ideally be machined with a quarter inch end mill. I am more or less restricted to using only the tooling I have at work since I left the majority of my end mill collection at my aunt's house while preparing the space for my future garage shop. The eighth inch end mills I have at my disposal will only cut half an inch deep before the shank starts rubbing. So these cutouts and slots in the turbo encabulator need to have corner radii larger than an eighth of an inch if I want to avoid my quarter inch end mill having to do an abrupt deceleration and sharp turn in the finishing toolpath, which could cause chatter. I communicated that to Zach and he made the appropriate tweaks to his model. If your client has the flexibility in their design, it's way easier and cheaper to change the model than to buy specialized tooling like long reach end mills.
Now, since this wasn't some crazy aerospace job shop work and I wasn't working with any drawings or firm geometric requirements, out of courtesy I asked if there was any need to meet a maximum or minimum tolerance on features like the inner bore here. Zach said the guts of what would go in here would be 3D printed, so he could adjust those parts on the fly as needed. There was no real precision needed. But just between you and me though, I knew I'd still be trying to nail that ID to within 0.1 millimeters. And lastly, I confirmed that Zach had no objections to a liberal application of chamfers to every conceivable edge on this part, because in addition to the pursuit of accuracy, it's basically in a machinist's DNA to want to break a sharp edge. With all the necessary dimensional adjustments made, I then added chamfers on all the vertical edges. The horizontal chamfers would be handled in the cam workspace. Then I duplicated this model with the pattern tool in Fusion. Bar stock naturally comes in one foot increments. Since Zach planned on assembling two scompling terminals plus a spare, I would be aiming to machine three turbo encabulators in one shot. The 3.75 inch diameter of the part meant that I could pattern two more encabulators just a hair over four inches apart and keep them all within the 12 inch bounds of my stock. These parts needed to be just over four inches apart to ensure that I had at least a quarter inch margin for an end mill to come in between them. Now, for these toolpaths, I'm going to really quickly go over the initial plan of attack before going over the specifics with some more interesting machining b-roll in the background. First, I need to put a true flat surface on my stock. Bar stock is not known for being a precision material. I'll use a rough facing toolpath followed by a finishing pass to reduce the thickness of my stock and leave a nice shiny surface. Then I'll flip my stock over. This side will start with a 3D adaptive roughing toolpath to bring the stock down to near net shape while leaving an onion skin. Then I'll do some semi-finishing and eventually proper finishing to make the faces as shiny as possible. Next I'll cut through the onion skin and finally chamfer the top facing edges. Here's how that played out on the CNC. The first order of business was to face one side of my stock. Since I was only hitting the top surface here, I could use a set of side clamps to hold the bar stock in place for this operation. One thing I think is useful to point out here is that I like to double up on my tease nuts when space permits, because you can only crank down on M6 fasteners so much before you risk stripping the hardware. Tiger claw clamps can generate a pretty significant amount of lateral force, so more nuts equals more better. Then you just let the program do its thing. The rough facing operation is a medium depth, medium step over toolpath that took off some nice consistent sized chips. 1.3mm depth of cut with a 3mm step over. Then I came back with a really shallow, larger step over pass that shaved another 0.1mm off the face for a shiny cosmetic finish that leaves the stock at 24mm thick. I ran the toolpath in climb cutting only mode to make the machining marks more consistent. This takes longer than running the toolpath in a zigzag back and forth pattern with the cutter engaged the whole time, but I'm only doing this once so it's not a big deal. With one good flat side established, I could then focus on the bulk of the material removal from the other side. It's out with the clamps and in with my long-standing frenemy double-sided tape. This setup started with the 3D adaptive roughing operation to bring the entire bar of stock to near net shape. I'm using a recipe that's scaled back slightly from my maximum effort test on the Shape Oco 5 Pro. Even though the HDM has a beefier water-cooled spindle and stepper motors running at a higher voltage for more power, you never know when something could go wrong that would create an additional load on the spindle, like an end mill clogging up from recutting chips or something. So I like having a little extra performance margin at the expense of speed on an untested program like this. Speaking of chip recutting, one of the things that really helps improve the reliability of a long aluminum program like this is air blast. As long as your end mill doesn't clog, it can cut indefinitely. Sure, lubrication helps, and I would never say that dry cutting aluminum is preferable to using a cutting fluid, but a strategic application of compressed air helps immensely, to the point that on a CNC router using 3 8 inch or smaller tooling, you can usually get by just fine with only compressed air. Now, I thought I had it all figured out here. Double-sided tape gives me full access to the part from all sides, air blast should allow me to cut super reliably indefinitely, I should be able to walk away for an hour and come back to a nearly finished set of three turbo encabulators. The thing I didn't appreciate enough about cutting aluminum though is that it generates heat. Even with quote unquote optimal speeds and feeds, not all of the thermal energy gets cast out with each chip. Some heat will still migrate into the stock. And despite the application of compressed air blowing steadily over the stock, the temperature is bound to creep steadily upwards. Heat transfer is proportional to the temperature differential. Until the stock warms up significantly, compressed air will only have a mild cooling effect. 
there is an equilibrium point for the system and it's going to be somewhere above room temperature. And then as material is removed, you will have less thermal mass to buffer the temperature, so you'll end up with more localized heating. Adhesives, unless they're formulated specifically for high temperatures, get weaker the warmer they get. So after an hour of machining, as my stock got thinner and hotter, it eventually got ripped off the table. I was away from the machine when it happened, but I caught it on the time lapse, so I know what happened. During an adaptive pass at the end of the stock where the end mill had the most leverage, it pulled the stock up and kicked it out of position. Then, before I could get to the machine, it plunged the end mill into a different section of the stock, at which point the end mill shattered. My manual thermometer estimated the temperature to be around 140 degrees Fahrenheit with a small margin of error. That's 60 Celsius for most folks, which is uncomfortable to hold for more than a few seconds, but unlikely to cause any lasting harm unless you're an idiot and don't let go. That may not seem excessively hot, but it's plenty warm enough to noticeably degrade the mechanical properties of a general purpose acrylic or rubber based adhesive. So despite my best efforts to choose slow and steady speeds and feeds and nail this on the first try, the turbo encabulators got the best of me. Despite the aggravation of that mishap though, I immediately started thinking about how to salvage the situation. I felt there was a pretty good chance I could save the parts. During the adaptive roughing tool path, I had left half a millimeter of stock to leave on my parts. If I could re-zero my stock to within a half millimeter margin of error, I could make it look like nothing had ever happened. Given where my machining attempt left off and lacking a better way to locate my parts, I figured I could hold onto the central bores of the encapulators in some pockets milled into MDF and then add in some locating features on the bottom of the bar stock. I designed a custom fixture that would snugly capture those cylindrical bosses, taking into account that the actual diameter I was targeting wasn't the final diameter of that part. I have to add in the stock to leave. I clamped down some plywood, faced it, machined the annular pockets needed, and tested my stock in the fixture. It took two attempts to dial in the perfect fit, and using a dead blow hammer I wedged my stock into the fixture. It did cross my mind that maybe I should have stuck some double sided tape in there too, as the success of this turbo encabulator saving operation now rested on nothing but friction. But the whole thing was extremely snug and I didn't want to pry it back out, and I was only planning on taking super light cuts. I first bored a quarter inch hole in the middle of each encabulator. These were for alignment pins so I could flip the stock back over and finish where I left off. Next, I ran a contour toolpath around each part, leaving 0.3 millimeters of stock to leave and going down one millimeter. This bought me clearance to use a chamfer mill to break the edges on the bottom of the parts. That was one omission from my original plan that bugged me slightly. I had no way to put a precise chamfer on the bottom of the turbo encabulators, but now I had a chance to remedy that. I guess you could consider this a happy accident. Fortunately, through all of this, my stock didn't budge at all. I pried everything out of the fixture and reapplied double-sided tape to the bottom of the stock. Using dowel pins, or end mills, I lowered the stock back onto the fixture in more or less the exact position needed. There was a tiny bit of slop in the holes because I hadn't bothered creeping up on the exact dimensions needed for a slip fit, but the margin of error was less than half a millimeter. That, if you remember, was how much room I had to play with because that's the amount of stock to leave I had set on my roughing toolpath. So my finishing toolpath should be able to touch every surface without leaving my turbo encabulator slightly oval shaped. I exported a cut down version of my roughing toolpath, said a quick prayer to the machining gods, and sent it. It took a few minutes for the roughing toolpath to catch up to the failure point at the correct step down, but after hovering over the pause button for a while I was confident that things were proceeding smoothly. When the roughing toolpath finished, it was a huge relief. Then the HDM went through semi-finishing toolpaths, and then a final finishing toolpath that was approximately 40% slower. One thing I'd like to point out is that this single flute isn't the best option for finishing since it's not as rigid as a multi-flute end mill. Something like the Carbide 3D 203 end mill would probably do a better job. That being said, I think the finish here is perfectly serviceable, you just shouldn't take my results here as the limits of what the HDM can produce. Nearly at the finish line now, I had a contour toolpath that would break through the onion skin that I'd left since the roughing toolpath. Everything that got trimmed off outside the turbo encabulators was fine, but at the inner bore I did have an instance where the little round puck of aluminum left behind was jostled around in the tight confines and it caused the spindle to kick back slightly leaving a small gouge on the walls. I know this was an area that wouldn't be visible on the finished part, but it still annoyed me just a little bit. The last thing to do on the HDM was to chamfer all the edges. 
This is always the most satisfying and relaxing part since you know you're at the finish line and the toolpath is not very aggressive so the odds of a mishap are minuscule. And we're done, with the machining at least. With these parts and my setup, there was a tiny bit of misalignment in the indexing, so I had to touch up some of the more marginally chamfered edges on the bottom with a deburring tool. I also took some time to clean up some adhesive residue on the bottom of the parts. And now I can call these parts done. These three turbo encabulators took twice as long as I planned because I overestimated the abilities of double-sided tape and underestimated the thermal impacts of machining. But that mishap was a good learning moment for me, and it gave me a chance to properly chamfer the crap out of this part. The result of all this machining is a pair of externally pristine parts, and one part that I'm charitably calling with air quotes, battle damaged. Maybe Zack can scuff it up a bit more and apply some weathering effects to make it look like a salvaged Star Wars relic. But if you want to see these turbo encabulators outfitted in their new scomplink housings, I highly encourage you to go check out Zack's video. I always find it fascinating how some electronics and motors or steppers or an Arduino can take a project to the next level, and Zack did an awesome job integrating everything together into a really cool package. I'll have a link to his video in the description below. If you guys enjoyed this video where it was more about the cam and tool pathing than the inspiration or design of a project, let me know in the comments down below. I will consider doing more of these in the future. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense.